The Buddha says that when you listen to a Dhamma talk, you shouldn't have contempt for the speaker. You shouldn't have contempt for the Dhamma that's being taught. That much you might expect. After all, if you look down on the speaker, it may happen that the speaker has something good to say, at least one or two sentences out of the talk, but you miss them if you have contempt. So you make yourself open. See what good might be here. What's really interesting is where he says, don't have contempt for yourself. In other words, don't look down on your ability. Don't tell yourself, this is something I can't do. The Buddha teaches the Dharma step by step. And it's always good to take the next step, if you can, or at the very least to solidify yourself in the step where you are. This is an important aspect of your sense of self as you practice. We know what the Buddha says, that ultimately we'll get beyond any assumptions about self. But that's when we don't need them. Because the perception of self, the perception of not-self, are both strategies for happiness. You figure out what you can identify with as your desires that are worth following, and which ones are the ones that are not worth following. You establish a sense of priorities. That's a healthy sense of self, and a healthy sense of not-self. In other words, the, the ones that come low on the list. You put aside, saying, I don't have to identify with those right now. I read one time of a Navy general who every day would make a list of the ten most important things that needed to be done. And then she would strike out everything except for one and two. And that's how she got things done. So in this case, the practice of meditation is something you want to identify with at the moment. Everything else you strike out. And the parts of the mind that said, oh, you're not up to this, you can't do this, strike those out too. Because after all, which part of the mind doesn't want you to practice? It's the part that's on the side of the defilements, on the side of going back to the, your old ways. But we all come here because we realize that our old ways of doing things are not satisfactory. We want something better. So always encourage yourself. Think of the way the Buddha would give a Dharma talk. He would instruct, urge, rouse, and encourage his audience. Notice, out of those four verbs, three of them are there to encourage you, urge, rouse, encourage to give you the confidence that, yes, you can do this, and it's worth doing. So when you're talking to yourself as you meditate, there will be some instruction as you tell yourself, now do this, now do that. And then the urging comes in, it's really worthwhile that you stick with it. Rouse is to rouse your energy when it begins to flag. And of course, encourage keeps you at it again. When you have confidence that you can do this, that's a healthy sense of self. You notice that the Buddha doesn't give you a very elaborate sense of self to hold on to in the course of the path. Simply that you can do this. You're capable of doing it, and you'll benefit. And if you don't do this, you're going to suffer. That's the only self you really need to develop as you practice. Because you're going to be focusing on your actions. So a self that is responsible, a self that is capable, a self that's going to benefit from the actions. That's all you need. 
and you give a lot of attention to the Buddhist shoulds. You should try to comprehend suffering. You should try to abandon its cause. You should try to realize the cessation of suffering by what you really should do is develop the path. That's where you want to rouse, urge, and encourage yourself. Now again, the Buddha sets out those shoulds, not because he's imposing them on you, He simply says, if you want to put it into suffering, these are the things you should do. This is the way things are. That's a set of views. We all know the four forms of clinging. Sensuality, views, habits and practices, and sense of self. There's no room for sensuality clinging in the path, but you have right views about the nature of action. And again, that's where the Buddha gets into a lot of detail, the nature of action. Views about other things he puts aside. Is the world eternal? Is it not eternal? Finite, infinite issues that consume other people. He says, don't even bother. Don't go there. All you need to know is that craving and clinging, if you hold on to them, lead to more rebirth. And the quality of your actions will determine the type of rebirth. But there's also a path of action that can get you beyond rebirth. So karma, rebirth, which both are teachings about action and the power of action. The Buddha does set out a sketch of the universe. These are the different places you can go. But they're all related to karma. Some of the levels of heaven, for example, are related to different stages of concentration, skills that you can master. So his, his design of the universe is not like what anybody else had designed at that time. Of course, he didn't design it, he didn't think it up. He just discovered that through action this is what you can experience. But often he's been accused of simply adopting the, the worldview of his culture. It's not the case. You look into the Upanishads, they had different views of the world, levels of the cosmos. You look into the Jain teachings of the time, they had a different view of the levels of the cosmos. So the Buddha's teachings about where action can lead to were distinctive, and they're all you need to know about views about the world. That and the fact that there is causality, and you have a role in the present moment where you can shape things. The present is not entirely shaped by the past. These are the things you hold on to as you follow the path. And it's not much, but it's there to focus your attention on what you're doing, instructing you as to what's skillful and what's not, urging you to do what's skillful, arousing your energy, the thoughts of what's going to happen to you if you don't develop skillful actions. And then to keep encouraging you to stick with it, stick with it. That's what the teachings provide, and that's what you should provide for yourself. We shape our experience through our intentions. We shape our sense of the body through the way we breathe. We shape our speech through directed thought and evaluation. We shape our mind through our perceptions and feelings. When you look in the the Buddhist teachings are the teachings of the Ajahns. They're giving you examples of how to shape your mental speech, how to shape your mind, to keep it on the path. So the examples are all set out, but they don't stop with the examples. The Buddha urges you, rouses you, encourages you. This is a good path, he said. And that covers both sides of discernment. Right view basically tells you the way things are, how they work. And then right resolve says it's good to act on this. 
which is why John Lee pointed out that when the Buddha talks about the three qualities that are brought to mindfulness practice and by extension to concentration practice. Mindfulness, ardency, alertness. Ardency is the wisdom faculty. The way the Buddha defines mindfulness, you can be mindful of anything, hold anything in mind. Simply being able to remember things that were done and said a long time ago. That's how he defines mindfulness. Nothing about skillful or unskillful. The same with alertness. You're alert to what you're doing. It could be skillful, it could be not skillful, but you're alert to it. The question of skillfulness comes in with the ardency, realizing that if you act on unskillful intentions, there's going to be suffering. So you're ardent in your effort to abandon what's unskillful and to develop what's skillful in its place. That's the wisdom, that's the discernment, and those three faculties. That's what takes mindfulness and turns it into right mindfulness. It takes alertness and turns it into right alertness. So you don't want to stop with knowing the Dharma or listening to instructions. You want to be able to urge, rouse, and encourage yourself. So you gain the benefit from the Dharma. The Dharma is like a recipe book. You can look at the book for hours and not get full. And actually looking, if it, there are a lot of pictures in the book, it makes you hungry. But if you follow the recipe, then you get full. That's when you realize the worth of that recipe. So keep encouraging yourself on the path. Don't look down at yourself, telling yourself you can't do it. Many, many people have fallen by the wayside in the past by thinking that. And what is that? It's just damaging yourself, destroying yourself, destroying your potential. The fact that you're here meditating means you've got some good to you. Don't let it go to waste. <laughs>